Let's get started. Yep. Hi everyone and welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break and today we've got a very special guest. Now we have Professor David Story. Now Professor doesn't need much of an introduction really in Australia. Pretty much everyone in anesthesia knows who Professor David Story is but for everyone listening out there he's the Foundation Chair of Anesthesia and the Deputy Director of the Centre for Integrated Critical Care at the University of Melbourne. He's a part-time staff anesthetist at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne, where his clinical work is predominantly perioperative care for sicker adults, including for liver transplantation. Now, his research includes perioperative outcomes and models of care, applied physiology, including acid-based disorders, and then environmental aspects of anesthesia as well. He studied medicine at Monash University and also graduated with a Bachelor of Medical Sciences on exercise at high altitude, and David received his Fansker in 1997. Now, his doctorate from the University of Melbourne is in, back in 2004 is on simplifying the Stewart approach to acid-based disorders, which we're hoping to talk with him about in this episode. And also besides being on a number of important committees, he was an examiner in the ANSCA primary exam for 12 years. Now, that's a long time. That's that's probably the maximum time, is that? Uh, it, it's a, that's a full tour of duty. Most things with ANSCA committees and everything is about 12 years. I then spent some time with what's called being an examiner, trainer, assessor, where you know, candidates will may recall that in the back of their their room sometimes when they're having their vivas, there's a third person there, and as we used to say, they're looking at the examiners, not not at the candidate. And so we would provide feedback to the examiners about you know their questions and how they interact with the candidates to try and optimise the experience for the candidates to demonstrate what they know. I'd like to emphasise that point. That is the aim of the examiners. The aim of the examiners is not to be sods. The aim of the examiners is to help the candidates demonstrate what they know. And that's not just ideology. That's the truth. That, and, that's and, quite reassuring, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and then for all, for all those who don't know, Dave was actually my examiner for, for my Viva during um, my, when I set the primary exam. In, and I would, uh, would actually like to say I personally failed the primary twice. So, um, and there's another very prominent Melbourne anaesthetist um, who's also got an outstanding academic career. I mean, well, yeah, my, yes, mine's good. Um, but, you know, missing out on the first part, you know, at, you will eventually get through if you, if you sort of work hard. And, and I think my, my biggest mistake was not to work adequately with others. I didn't really have a, for various reasons, I didn't really have a good a, a group. And I think that was one of my fundamental errors when I look back on it. And that's quite an inspirational story to know that despite all those failures, you've amassed this, this illustrious CV, which is almost going to take up the whole time of this, uh, of this episode to go through. Um, well, the, the really funny thing was that when I, the, the third time I sat and passed, um, halfway through the physiology exam, they said, so what do you want to talk about? And part of my brain, which is like, not renal, not renal, not renal. <laughs> and so because I had an honours degree in high altitude physiology, I said, high altitude, please. And off I went. And off you went. Now, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> um, so look, I, I think, you know, with that story, I think we got, we, I think will give us an opportunity to sort of explore that mm. uh, in the future. And I, and I think it's going to resonate with a lot of candidates who haven't been successful and mm. just need that uh, inspiration and guidance uh, in terms of what to do. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you, is, so, you know, having the right study group and that really would have helped. Is that something you modified for the times you, you, you did pass? Well, it's actually in retrospect, um, it was to do with sort of when I, the, the, the cohort I had when I started for various reasons. One already had the first part and, you know, in my sort of, if you group, I, I trained at the Alpha and the, and the guys I was going through with. And so I just sort of, in a sense, got left behind. They sort of got through, particularly when I failed the first time. And it was more the insight I got from when I did the second part. I don't think I, I really adequately worked out where I was going wrong with the first part. And then by the time I got to the second part, I realised that was my fundamental error. The other thing was also just not doing practice exams. That, that was my, you know, I mean, I made, the reason I failed three times, well, sorry, failed twice, was because I made some fundamental errors in how I was going about it. And when I look back at, you know, the, these, these are the things I try to convey to, to trainees so I'm talking to them about it. No, I think uh, there's so much to, to sort of learn from those experiences. And I, I think we'll have to dedicate like another episode uh, to that, Lark. Yes, sounds good. We'll, we'll, book, you, we'll book you in. Book well, in I'd, I'd be very happy to give, it, give the examiner's view. I mean, you know, having been on both sides of the fence, yeah. um, it, it is interesting to sort of describe what it's like being an examiner and how you think and um, uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, so today we're going to, I think, talk about another topic that's sort of um, that you're an expert in acid base. And this is something you had a, um, you did a PhD in. 
Um, is that correct? Yeah, so it was actually, so I started out in high altitude physiology and then the acid base, particularly if you look at chronic um, uh, hyper, hyperventilation and chronic hypocapnia and acid base change associated with altitude, it, it's a cousin. So it was a, it was a relatively easy morph. And then also because the focus I really had was on um, fluids. Why fluids? If you look at a bag of saline, why is a bag, you know, it really was the question, why is a bag of saline acidic? That that was really what got me going in the, in the first instance when I was a registrar. And that just sort of rolled on and then it rolled into the steward approach. Um, yeah. And, you know, as I often say to people, why one of the reasons to do a, a, a higher research degree is there's something nice about knowing a lot about something. It's sort of, you know, is self-sustaining, particularly for something you like. Mm. And, I, you know, and subsequently I found I can apply it a lot in my day-to-day -day work, particularly in more complex cases. So, and, and that's how it's evolved. Yeah. And, and so for the primary uh, candidates who are listening to this podcast, th there are so many definitions or so many ideas on, in terms of what an acid is. Mm. Like how, how do you approach it? And what's an acceptable uh, definition as an examiner that you would like to hear? Okay. So, if you actually look in, in even in, in textbooks of chemistry or, or probably more broadly textbooks of science and, and dictionaries, there are actually a number of different definitions. And it's, it's a little bit like an MDT looking at a patient. You've got a whole lot of different views of the same thing and they're not necessarily wrong. They're just applying for that particular situation. So, you know, it's, it may be that something that turns litmus paper red or tastes sour, they're still legitimate definitions of, of acidic things. Um, the one that's sort of the operational one, so the, the um, Bronsted-Lowry, which is it's a hydrogen ion donor. Now, the thing about that was it was designed so it wasn't just water-based solutions. It allows for different types of solvents. An older one um, is the um, what I call the generalised Arrhenius. So Arrhenius is a really interesting guy who is a professor um, of chemistry in Sweden. And he you know, had the experience of almost failing his PhD, but then subsequently won the Nobel Prize. So, um, Common theme here, but failing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but he also, also, he also was the first one to say that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. And this was about 1913. So he's, anyway, so Arrhenius had this definition that you know, I paraphrase, which is it's something that when you add it to, to a water-based solution, so any biological fluid, um, increases the hydrogen ion concentration in that solution. Now, the beauty for us in anesthesia is it means that carbon dioxide is therefore by an acid in its own right. If you have to use Bronsted-Lowry, you wind up having to talk about carbonic acid. So to my mind, I'm very big on simplifying things and making them pragmatic. And there's a guy called George Box who's got this really, it was talking a lot about um, models and he said you know all models are wrong but some are useful and what he really meant was particularly in things like the complexity of biology no model can adequately describe it it's really is it and he said he talked about elegant simple models and i realized that that was sort of what i was trying to achieve which was things that were elegant simple and were adequate may not cover everything and i think this you know when you see people sort of get stuck into Stuart and other aspects of almost anything we do Often it's because there are these nuances in, a, in highly technical physiology that just doesn't work. So I'm interested in how do we do this every day? Um, so the Arrhenius definition allows us to talk about um, uh, rather than carbonic acid, just around carbon dioxide. So we as anaesthetists are working with carbon dioxide the whole time, you know, even with our surgical friends pumping it into patients. So th that I think that is a much more useful definition. Therefore, if you look at things like, uh, you know, say adding saline, saline um, you know, increases acidity. Is, is sodium, you know, a difference in sodium chloride uh, an acid? In fact, if you go back before 1950, that there are people who would call chloride an acid and would call sodium a base. I think that adds a degree of, um, I think it clouds the picture a bit if you're trying to get your head around acid base. Mm. So I've been thinking recently about, why acid base is problematic and th th this is sort of some of my ideas so one is that acid base is all about change that you um so i've just got a dog going past <laughs> dragging something <laughs> um, but, um a special another special guest uh, yeah another special guest wanting to learn about acid base yeah <laughs> <laughs> um 
anyway, so the, the whole asset base is all about change. And so one of the things is to say that we've got this point and if you move from this point that that is what about asset based change and disorders is all about. And so the, the point is, you know, where your pH 7.40 is we talk about carbon dioxide is a partial pressure of 40 millimetres of mercury. Bicarbon is 24. Now, if we then move into the broader things, it also means your base success is zero. And we can come back to what base success is. I think it's a particularly useful thing. Um, and then also, if you go into the steward side of things, it's also where sodium is 140. So it's about the middle of the reference range. Um, chloride is about 105, again, the middle of the reference range. Albumin is 42. So if you put together this idea that you've got this fixed point, and yes, it might be you know, a, a broader range of things, but it becomes, the model is easier and much more pragmatic if you think about that one point and movement from there. Yeah. The other thing associated with that is if you have movement, there's a, a primary disorder, and you've only really got sort of three broad options in the way we think about asset base. And one is that you're sort of roughly in the normal range. And then you've got, I'm outside the normal range and something has changed. And you've got two options, either compensated or uncompensated. And, and they're really just your broad diagnostic options. Um, and if it's uncompensated, it's by definition a mixed disorder. And where we see mixed disorders every day in our practice is that we, uh, when we make someone with a spont spont vent general anesthetic, the CO2 goes up their kidneys have not had time to catch up. And so you effectively have a mixed disorder. Similarly, when our surgical friends pump in carbon dioxide for laparoscopic surgery, they are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the patient and that effective respiratory side has changed without renal compensation. So every day in our practice, we would see patients, even in gas, you'd see a mixed disorder. And so the mixed disorder is really just a classification. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean the patient may catch up, doesn't say what the diet, it just says this is the snapshot and this is where we are. But this is how much we have changed from our, pardon me, our fixed point. Right. So I think that that's something to think about the fixed point and think about the change and the nature of the change. And there's only a limited number of options in the, you know, in the diagnostic model we have for asset base. So, so Dave, just to, um, just to sort of summarize and clarify that clinical scenario. So with a spot van general anesthetic, where you're delivering volatiles, opioids, they're hypoventilating yeah. just to increases. That's a respiratory acidosis. Correct. Right? Right. Acidemia from respiratory acidosis. Yeah. But because they haven't had time to compensate renally, what you're also saying is that there's a metabolic acidosis too, or relative metabolic acidosis. Is, is that what you mean by, un by uncompensated or mixed? Yeah, yeah. So, so if you think about it, so if your CO2 um, goes up, yeah. so... so I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'd like to step back one further point. One of the things I think acid base is difficult is you've got two things going on. One, you've got the physical chemistry, particularly if you think about the, uh, um, the equilibrium equation for carbon dioxide and, and water in one end and bicarbonate hydrogen the other end and, by, and carbonic acid in the middle. Yeah. So often to simplify the model in a classic George Box kind of way, we take the carbonic acid out and we're left with CO2 at one end and, um, and bicarbonate at the other. And the hydrogen ions. Yes. So the other thing that then happened, so when we, and, and that, that's the physical chemistry. Yes. And, and one of the things is we sometimes see that. So our patient where the surgeons are pumping in carbon dioxide into a, a patient under, you know, with fixed ventilation and well before the kidneys can kick in, that is really just physical chemistry. You know, you see your, your end tidal CO2 go up. That, that's straight up and down physical chemistry. However, compensation is a physiological thing. It's not the physical chemistry. I think this is where people get, this is why it's confusing. Yes, yes. Because you've got these two things. One is straight up and down physical chemistry is almost like you've got a closed box, which effectively a patient who's yet to have their kidneys change things and who's on fixed minute ventilation will be, they're like a closed box and you're pumping CO2 in and you're looking at the change. That's physical chemistry. Yes. In a patient who can compensate both their own ventilation or, or we compensate for them by adjusting their, their, their ventilation and their effectively their kidneys but also other things work then that is a physiological response and so if we go to the, the henderson hasselback equation and this is you know where it comes into it so you've got carbon dioxide and you've got bicarbonate or even better it's the henderson version of the equation which is much more intuitive if you're talking about hydrogen ions and you've got co2 and bicarbonate um and so 
it, it's a change in each of those. So here we've got the, the lungs controlling the carbon dioxide and the kidneys controlling the bicarbonate. Yeah. Now, what we can also do is if we say bicarbonate's a marker, but isn't the mechanism, this is where Stuart changes. So this is the, the evolution. So you can still talk about the Henderson Hasselbeck because it, it does adequately describe the situation in your snapshot, but it's not just, it, it is much more complex physiology. Now, if you take the bicarbonate and rather than saying, let's say it's the bicarbonate that the body's changing, particularly the kidneys are changing, it's actually the strong iron difference, particularly how it handles sodium and chloride. And so that's where Stuart comes in. So rather than saying my kidneys are, are, are directly changed in bicarbonate, it's saying my kidneys are indirectly changed in bicarbonate so I can measure it, but it's really due to how the, the, the sodium and the chloride are handled. Right. And so if you were to look at a book like Vanda, so if you go back to the you know, first part reading and all that sort of stuff, and if you flipped it, and we actually wrote an article about this about 10 years ago, um, looking at the physiology of chloride and saying, flip your, your renal physiology. Instead of looking at how the bicarbonate is handled, look at how the sodium and the chloride are handled and the bicarbonate will follow. So the, the other beauty is it simplifies it. So wow. plasma chemistry is like this. Yeah. Acid base is also fundamentally um, associated with the sodium and the chloride handling, so in, in the kidneys. Yeah. And, that, that, and then if you add saline, so it's all a much more universal thing. It combines... The, the, the chemistry of sodium and chloride in plasma, giving fluids, how the kidneys work. And so even things like that, you know, we used to all sort of struggle with, or you might not have stand, but you know, the rest of us did. Um, <laughs> that, still a struggle, still a struggle. Yeah, but, but yeah, this ammonium, ammonium handling in the kidneys. What, what's that all about? You know, you produce bicarbonate and you know, all this sort of stuff. If you just said, right, oh, ammonium, the only purpose ammonium serves is to allow you to excrete chloride without sodium. That's all right. it does. Right. Okay. Why does your bicarbonate change? Because you've changed your chloride. Right. And so it becomes you're, you're, you're like, changing, you're actually changing the framing of it. Yeah. And, and looking at the chloride. Yeah. You, other you're, than you're, flipping, you're flipping the paradigm. Right. And if you bring that paradigm to exactly the same physiology and look at it backwards, it actually, to my mind, unifies and simplifies it. Similarly, if you look at phosphate, so phosphate, that we've, we've talked about, I mean, we've talked about, you know, the strong ions in plasma, the dominant ones, which are sodium and chloride. Yep. Then the major um, weak acid is albumin. Right. And then the other one is phosphate. And you'll only really see phosphate play a major role in, in acidifying in patients with renal failure. So you'll see a hyperphosphatemia. So as the phosphate goes up, it's a weak acid and that will acidify the, the plasma. Yeah. But if you think about the renal physiology, again, where we try to generate bicarbonate, now, if you excrete phosphate, you excrete a weak acid. Yeah. That's it. So yeah. the, the phosphate itself is acidifying. And you don't have to worry about hydrogen ion handling. You don't have to worry about bicarbonate. It's just you got rid of phosphate. So if you retain phosphate, you get acidosis. If you excrete phosphate, you're controlling acidosis to a certain degree. Yeah. So we've now covered, if you go back to van and think all those things used to drive you nuts. So you've, you've dealt with bicarbonate, you've dealt with phosphate, you've dealt with ammonium, and it all comes back to sodium and chloride and then the weak acids. And, and just so that there's clarity um, for the listeners, when we talk about sodium and chloride being um, part of the strong ions, as in chloride being a, a, a strong acid, how does that fit in with the definitions that, that, you've, that you've talked about? Like how, how is chloride, you know, a, an acid in the bronsted lowry definition or, or how is chloride an acid in the Arrhenius I, definition? I, I'm reluctant to... I'm reluctant to really call chloride an acid because I think it just becomes too confusing. But I think... If you think about if you add um, sodium chloride to plasma, it is acidifying. Yes, agreed. So, so if you add, um, particularly because you'll change the difference between the sodium and the chloride. So if you add equally molar sodium chloride, that is acidifying. So yeah. it is in a sense a rather than rather than sort of calling an acid in its own right, I'm more I'm more inclined to say it is an acidifying thing in particularly right. if you think about plasma. Okay. I mean, the, the more we move away from Bronsted Lowry, the, the more confused it all becomes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm also very aware. I mean, I, I was trying to think of an analogy. So Stuart and what I'll call the bicarbonate-based approaches are a bit like sort of, if you like, English and German or Mandarin and Cantonese. You know, they, they're talking about the same different. thing, yes, but in a different language. But 
that they are interacting. Yes. It's just the way, it's, it's sort of the way you, you view it. And, and for the, the first part candidates, they really need to be able to speak both languages. Right. So, so I can, you know, I can say, right, I will now switch on my bicarbonate brain and think like a bicarbonate person. Yes. Although I never do that clinically. But if I'm talking to a trainee, I might say, look, let's think about it by carbon. Let's think about Stuart. Isn't the Stuart way so much better? Yes. You know, that's, that's often the purpose of me doing that. So, so it's really the strong, it's really the strong iron difference between sodium and chloride yeah. affects bicarb. So, yeah. So, so the key to understanding it all, I think very visually, are what are called the gamble grams. Yeah. So you referenced my 2016 paper, and I think it's also in the other one, the, the much the earlier one. Four. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is if you think about uh, one of the problems with the definitions of acid base is they are definitions, they are not laws of chemistry. Right. They're really applying what you want. There's, in fact, a Lewis definition, which is just hydrogen ions. Yes. So, you know, there are all these different definitions. And it's really how you're using it. You know, so sour is if you're a cook and litmus paper is if you're a pool person or something like that. Um, so I'm using the Arrhenius definition, which, you know, works for what we do. Yes. Um, you can use Bronsted Lowry, but to my mind, it complicates rather than simplifies things. Yes. I mean, um, and and, that, and that, I mean that, but that's really that's yeah. really interesting to know that you know we because we we learn all these definitions and we try to build our knowledge mm. on these definitions and then when we've got concepts which don't flow on the definitions, it I think that that's where the confusion. Yeah, is. yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, you know, in my in my practice up up till now, I feel like uh, you know the it's very familiar to know how to read an ABG and go, oh, that's the pH. Mm. That's what the CO2 mm. is doing. That's what the bicarb is doing. Mm. And then I can calculate compensation and, and it all kind of makes mathematical sense. And then the way I've seen, I've never, I've never been given formulas, you know, reading an article, you've got some very specific formulas and mm. how to you know, predict certain things. But in my clinical practice, as soon as something like, you know, giving a lot of normal saline occurs and we get the hypochloremic mm. acidosis, uh, you know, I, I don't use a formula. I just use a, you know, a clinical picture and go, well, that's acidosis, mm. not just because of this, but because of the, you know, the um, sodium chloride pore. I think in your examples, sepsis may be sepsis in someone who's hypoalbuminemic. And I can just invoke these things without necessarily any kind of extra mathematics. Do you think the, the uh, do you think we need to learn these extra mathematics? Yeah, so, so where I, I think, so... Several things. One is, as you very much pointed out, Lahiro, the traditional way of thinking is qualitative. You know, the, the one thing I didn't mention is some very good acid-based diagrams, which sort of I call the hectopus, you know, that's sort of got the normal range and then acute um, alkalosis and acidosis of metabolic and respiratory and then the chronic respiratory, so six-legged thing. And either you're in the legs or if you're not in the legs and you're outside the normal range, then you've got a mixed disorder. And it's just a visual way of thinking about it. Um, so, but it's, if you think about it, it's qualitative, yes, no, basically, um, I think there is value in trying to understand, particularly in sick patients and complex patients, what's, what's going on. And in fact, there's a Canadian guy who I've never met called John Friesen, who turned my 2016 paper into a web app. And if you Google bedside steward and ignore the bit about Martha Stewart bedside lamps, you'll, you'll <laughs> find it. And what I say to people, just give it a go. And it, it's got the background. It's actually got a number of the calculations. So the, the thing is that where you, where you don't really suspect it. So the example in my clinical work is in liver transplantation, where often the patients have a sodium sort of in the low 30s and a chloride that is normal, but in fact have quite a significant relative hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Just to clarify that, low 130s or actually? Oh, well, I'll say 132. So say if they're down, well, let's make it 130 just to make the, the maths easy. Yeah. So if the chloride stays normal at 105 and the sodium drops from 140 to um, 130, that will give them a sodium chloride effect on base excess of minus 10. So yeah. they will have a really you know, solid. So the rough, my, my rough rules of base excess, and we can talk about that a bit more if you like, is yeah. that if you have a change, so again, this idea of change, so if you have a change more than 2.5, so either up or down, something's probably going on. If you have a change of five, particularly if you have a, a base excess more negative than minus five, you have a, a clinically important thing going on. Yeah, or something quite pathological. Mm. So 
if you get a patient and they come to theatre and they've got known, you know, they've got cirrhotic liver disease, that's a bad thing in the first place for, for you know, managing them. But also they have this acidosis. You think, God, why have they got this acidosis? Sometimes you'll find it's predominantly the sodium chloride effect. The other thing is there is some evidence, and I'm hoping to produce some more, that a if you if you quantify the um, sodium chloride effect, you quantify the album effect, you quantify the lactate effect, what's left over is the other ions. This bears a reasonable relationship to particularly the corrected anion gap. But again, as you're saying, Lahiru, it tends to be, is it yes or no, a raised anion gap? It's not quantified. So if you quantify it and find that the effect of the other ions is more negative than minus five, that is far more clinically significant, probably, than a sodium chloride effect of minus five. So this is where we come into why to, why to quantify it, because it allows you to say, well, if I fix this bit, I can fix most of my problems. You know, if I bring my, if I push the chloride down a bit, so from 105 down to 100, I, sodium will stay about the same. So I'm not going to get, you know, effects of adverse effects of rapid sodium change. I fix my acid base or I give myself a bit more C room if you've got other acidifying things going on. The so reason- What's interesting here, Dave, is that what you're saying is that it's not just, because um, the absolute value of chloride is, is normal. But yeah. it's how it compares to sodium. Yeah, it is a relative of exactly. Yeah, because yes. okay. yeah. the normal the normal difference is thirty five, yeah. I mean between sodium and chloride. Roughly, yeah, 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 yeah. And so if that difference between a sodium and chloride, and, and you can you can do it either way, either the if, if that difference, ion, if you get yeah, a decrease in your strong ion difference, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so and so your treatment would be, and for you would be to either reduce chloride, mm. but but. But can you can you also think about increasing sodium slowly? Well, well remember, yeah, I mean you can increase sodium slowly. Um, the but you know there is are these concerns about you know pontine myelinosis and, mm -hmm. and those sort of things and and how much you change it. So it is possible to hold the sodium and drop the chloride. But how, but how do you do that? Ah, uh, now that, that's that's line, doesn't it? Well, so the way you can do that is actually to use dilute solutions of sodium bicarbonate. Or in my view, I actually call it sodium with carbon dioxide. That's one way to think about yeah. it. Yeah, because because some would argue when you use sodium bicarbonate, it's the bicarbonate that's the... Yeah, I mean, look, this is the chicken and the egg. This is the one we haven't really sorted out. Now, so I, we're yet to do adequate human studies, but I found this fascinating horse study. Because one of the things they do in racing, horse racing, is called milkshaking, which is giving horses bike bicarbonates or if you like sodium um, and they alkalize the horse before a race and therefore it's thought to buffer that you know that they are less affected by the buildup of lactic acid right and, and there was the i think there's pretty good evidence that that's, that's good for athletics in general yeah yeah it's, it's a bit, <laughs> but it you know it, it it's a big deal in horse racing apparently so there's a really interesting crossover study in, in ponies where what they did was they had you know, over about a six, six hour period. So one lot had, were just the control group and they got nothing. One lot got water, one lot got bicarbonate and one got lot by, by, bicarbonate and water. And if you look at the two groups who got bicarbonate, they had a very similar change in bicarbonate. They didn't measure the basic test, but they looked at the bicarbonate. And so similar change, but in the ones who got the, the just the, the bi sodium bicarbonate, they had a rise in their sodium, not much of a change in their chloride, but they had a widening of their strong ion difference. The ones who got water as well had a small change in their sodium, but a drop in their chloride. And so, with a so here you have differences in how the electrolytes change, but a similar overall acid base effect. Mm. And so, it can. I actually apply this particularly in liver transplants. So I use, I make up um, slightly hypertonic solutions of sodium bicarbonate. Yep. Um, and you can administer that. And if you look at the gases, the sodium stays about the same and the chloride drops. Right. So, so you can actually directly apply it. You get a bag of water, not dextrose, put in your, you know, you can actually fit 200 millimoles of sodium bicarbonate, make it up to 1200 mils, about 170 millimole per litre. Yes. And um, it's actually known at the Austin as Uncle Dave's magic mix. <laughs> and, only at the Austin. <laughs> yeah, only at the Austin. This is an Austin special. Should, should we give but, the but, disclaimer, disclaimer now? That, uh, yeah. well, <laughs> well, look, I mean, no, is, it, is, it, is it off label? Don't know. But is using the solution I mean. It makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? And, yeah. I, and, and, so what, and so what you're doing is you are modifying the strong iron difference. Mm. And, and by doing that, 
it changes your bicarb concentration. Well, 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 so if you think about it, so the thing, the way to think about the strong iron difference, if you go back to the gamble grant, yeah, is that if the strong iron difference, so so say if the same so the same, but the chloride comes up, yes, in that gap is the is the bicarbonate. Yes. So if the chloride comes up, it squeezes out bicarbonate, yes. and, and that is literally the because, Stuart. Because, so, that, because that's, that's a weak that's, acid, yeah. and, and, and so it can it can be squeezed out because it's a weak. Well, well stay away from calling bicarbonate a weak acid. I okay. mean, yes, it is, but don't you, you just you just confuse yourself if yes. you try and mix it all up. Think of think of bicarbonate as being this other stuff or your yes. marker. It's almost like you're squirting your know, methylene weak blue acid. going in or out or something. Yes, yeah, you know, it is a marker. It's not the mechanism. Right. Yes, okay. yes, are the hydrogen ions over in the corner, and, and they're also changing with this. And they're, yes. they're, the, the, the important thing is the hydrogen ions, ultimately physiologically, because they change protein structure and function through the change in surrounding pH. And so, I mean, that, that's just like a new, I mean, even though it's been around for a while, but it, it's really a, a, a new way, I mean, sort of like a, even for me now, like it's such a, a, an elegant way to sort of think about that. Because we've always we've always focused on bicarb, haven't we? Yeah. But but now what we're going to do now is we should focus on the strong iron difference, and yeah. that way the bicarb is actually a, a a subproduct of that strong iron difference. Yeah. The, the the bicarb you can you know if you want to do have you you diagnose acid base using bicarbonate, you can do yeah. that and it doesn't change. It's a marker, not the mechanism. Yeah. Okay. And I was very pleased to say that I was listening to an anesthesiology podcast yesterday, and they were talking about the use of saline in kidney. Um, in kidney transplants and delayed graft function. And they took, they mentioned passing the metabolic acidosis of saline. And I was delighted to hear this person say, oh yes, and if you give them saline, it, it reduces the strong iron difference and produces acidosis. I was like, yes, yeah, we're yes. getting that, no? <laughs> you know, mainstream anesthesiology podcast. So I thought, oh, that's good. That's fantastic. But but does it doesn't acidosis increase uh, vasodilation and increase perfusion? Or? Oh, look, I mean, you know, but see, this is where you get back to the George Box stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it is incredibly complex. I mean, wh wh what is a clinically important acidemia? What is the point where your acidemia um, you know, is affecting function? It's probably under about 7.25. Okay. Um, definitely under 7.15. So this is where you're starting to have ch direct changes in things like contractility and heart muscle and things like that. The difficulty with acid base is it's rare that you've got a pure acid basing. There's something else going on. Sepsis being the ultimate example. Patients, you know, my view is the reason we see so much unmeasured ions, or if you like, wide anion gap mm. in um, in sepsis. I was thinking about this recently. Yes, there are metabolic products, but I reckon you actually get cell lysis and apoptosis and all sorts of things just dropping junk into the into the system. Yeah. And, and so whenever we've tried to look at what's happening, um, what are, are these unmeasured ions? It, no one's really got very far, and I think because it changes within patients and between patients, it just, right. you know. As we know, I mean, sepsis is different in, in individuals. We sort of look at the, the big picture. And I think the way the body's reacting to the inflammation and infection varies between individuals and the nature of junk being dropped into their circulation is also changing as well. And, and so you mentioned albumin and phosphates. Mm. They, so they, they're weak acids and, yep. and they'll also have an effect on bicarb as well. Is that, is that right? But not, yeah. not the same magnitude? Yeah, so remember the phosphate and um, an albumin, we think of them as weak anions, that is they're negatively charged. So if you, when you're doing your gamble gram on the, the positive side, on the cation side, it's basically just sodium. Yeah. On the other side, the dominant is chloride, so 105. Then yep. bicarbonate, you know, this is at the fixed point, you know, yes. at our magic fixed point. Yes. So then you've got bicarbonate 24. Yes. The, the ionic effect of albumin is about 11 or 12. And then there's a little bit of phosphate effect, which is about you know 0.3 times the concentrated phosphate. So it might be just a two, two or something like that. Yes. One or two. So if you think again about the gamble gram, so in the patient, so their albumin's like that, and they're 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 in the negative column. And if the albumin goes down, which is a common thing in sick patients, yeah, that allows the bicarbonate in. Right. So, so the one law of chemistry that must apply is electron neutrality. So the pluses must equal the, must equal the minuses. Yes. Um, so that must happen. Therefore, if your pluses stay the same and one of your minuses change, it has to be a, you know, a compensation, if you like, at least if you think about it visually yes. like that. So if the albumin drops, the chloride, and the, if the chloride stays the same, then 
um, there's more room for bicarbonate. So, that so that is you, the way to think about it. So if you, in this liver patient who is hypo, who's got low albumin, if you, what you're saying is that if you try to fix the albumin, you're actually going to worsen the Correct. acidemia? Yeah, right. yeah. So if you have someone with severe acidemia, one of the worst things you could probably give them in the short term is 4% albumin. Right. I mean, so you know, but, but yeah. to go back to, to the other point I think Lahiri was making is there is a whole lot of complexity. You know, there's some evidence that, that albumin itself, just giving say 20% albumin in patients with sepsis may be a good thing to do. But I think to give 4% albumin, which has both in a, in a severe acidemic state, um, will mean that you may um, make the acid base acutely worse. Yes. Okay. Um, remembering that the whole thing about this ratio of one to three, you know, crystalloid colloid is, is rubbish. It's probably, you know, more like one to 1. 1.5 at best. One to, as in, as in, as in sort of. Um, so, so if you look at the ratios, uh, yeah. for, 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 you know, when I was a lad, you know, it was sort of this, this alleged three to one ratio. Yes, you know? That's right. But if you look at the studies, like the SAFE study and things like that, it's nothing like that. It, it's a much smaller difference. Right. And, and so, yes, you might give a little less volume, but it's not a radically different thing. It's not like sort of, you know, packed cells versus crystalloid. It's, yeah. it's, it's you know, so the, the advantages of colloid are uncertain. And okay. so, Dave, is it as simple as, so you've got a patient who's hypoalbuminemic yeah. and has an acidemia and you're, you know, the general sense of looking at numbers and trying to get to normal is to replace albumin. That is a problem, but that's just from an acid base point of view. Well, well, well the, the, other, the other thing I would add is that the low albumin masks things. So, so this is again, the, the quantitative stuff. So your base excess will increase by 2.5 a uh, millimole per litre for every 10 gram per litre your, your albumin drops, okay? okay? So if your albumin's dropped from 42 down to 32, that's plus 2.5. You become, become more alkalotic. That's, yeah, that's you get an alkalosis, but it means it masks other things. So in the same way that you correct for albumin when you do the anion gap, it's exactly the same correction factor, in fact, for, for base excess in Stewart. You are unmasking the severity of the acidosis. So if you say an acidosis more negative than minus five is, is a bad thing, right. it may be partly hidden by the hypoalbuminemia. Yeah. So in the same way the traditional is saying, yes, you should correct the anion gap, you also need to look at the acid base status overall. I mean, Stuart emphasised looking at the whole picture. Yeah. but And some people criticise compartmentalising, but I think to particularly isolate the severity of the different components... Um, is helpful in understanding the severity of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I'm quite interested in saying, well, you know, if you show that you have a base excess effect of unmeasured ions more negative than minus five, there is some suggestion that is a, a poor prognostic factor. So that's yet another reason to quantify it. And I'm hoping to get funding um, to, to do some database analysis looking at admission blood gases and look at that point and see where it's associated within hospital mortality. You know, ICU patients. I'm getting so, some. Uh, I'm just hearing some parallels, almost with um the you know use, use, the use of you know, tag and rotum that's now been interesting. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of hospitals. You know, we we initially just went INR, APTT, and platelets, and now we're looking at it all together in a yeah. situation. And it's it, we haven't got to the point. I feel that you know I'm I'm not thinking about this every day if I've got a sick patient. I'm not applying mm -hmm. a tag style system you're looking at the ma maximum amplitude and if you know the trail off and uh and you know the fib 10 and everything but if, i feel like this is somewhere that potentially this needs to happen where we well, we... well so this is the beauty of the the, the app is that you can mm. just play with it you can play with it i mean you know if you're bored you can actually change things and see how they change mm. um or cruise through your icu or you know your your icu nurse educators will probably have a you know, set of fantastic horrible gases I've got an absolute ripper that's of this patient who had um, hyponatremia and, and normal chloride. So actually had a, a relative hyponatremic um, metabolic alkalosis aggravated by um, al hyperalbuminemic alkalosis. So she came from the ward with a base excess of plus eight. And if you say to people, you know, the traditional, please explain this to me, they can't. Mm. Where Stuart explains it exactly. Because of the low albumin. Well, the low albumin, but, but also that, in fact, the reason that this patient is not, has a relative hypochloremia. Yeah. In an absolute sense, they do not have hypochloremia, but in a relative sense, they do. Right. Because the sodium was about 150. 
Yes. So, so you've had a marked change. Again, this whole thing of change. So your sodium has changed big time. You've yeah. then had a big time change in your, in your metabolic acid base status. And, and you were talking about the other ions and how you measure it to, to minus five. So is that, is that the difference between the formula that you've created and the base excess that's calculated? Is, is so, that so, well, 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 so, so your overall metabolic effect is your, is your base excess. And in passing, there's a fantastic review of base excess um, done by Ken Berend, published in the New England Journal about 2018. And I'd strongly recommend people having a look at that. I think it's very good. There's a version of sort of the Stuart approach, which is related to mine. It's a little bit different. You know, I'm incredibly biased. So I think mine's a bit better because it's simpler. Um, but Ken's explanation, Ken's a really interesting guy. He comes from the Dutch Antilles in the Caribbean. Um, but he's written this fantastic article about base success. And one of the things, I'll, you know, as some of you may, may know, the Americans don't particularly like base success because it wasn't invented by them. And in fact, there was a response in, in the New England Journal in 2018, if you think about it, um, saying, oh, we should stick with bicarbonate. Because, they said literally because it's the American way. And I thought, fantastic. <laughs> you know, from Boston, of course. And Dave, um, just quickly, what's yeah. the, how do you spell, I'll put this in the show notes. How do you spell Barron? Uh, B B R E N D. I haven't got that wrong. Berend. New England Journal of Medicine. And yep. about um, oh, do, do you you wouldn't remember the title of the article, would you? I think it's just called Base Success. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'll I'll send it to you, and you can. I, I think it's a very useful article. Um. Ken Ken myself and another guy spoke at the American Society of Anesthesiologists meeting in a session on acid base and great guy. Very good article, yeah. And, you know, as we're talking about all this, do you, you wouldn't happen to have a, like an exa a rough example that you'd remember to talk us through how you would literally work through the acid-based problem to then, you know. Well, well look, I'll, I'll tell you a really interesting one. It was a kid, so I was with the, at the children's and we're doing a liver transplant for a kid with a metabolic abnormality. And I think she might've had hypercholesterolemia um, and had... Uh, a basic says starting basic says about minus 6.5. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but one of my, you know, so it is more uh, sufficiently negative to be concerned about it. But the real interesting thing about this kid was that she actually had plasmapheresis with albumin. And so when you went through it, so she had a, a relative hyperchloremic acidosis and a relative hyperalbuminemic acidosis. So it was a good demonstration of the point we're just trying to make. He was, he was a kid that actually had what overall was quite a, what appeared to be a bad situation. But when you analyzed it, realized it was iatrogenic and not a big deal. Mm. Yep. But you did have a kid who was starting with a basic sense of minus six. So that if you didn't really work on that, by the time that you've gone through the anapatic phase and everything else, where there's a lot of um, you know, changes in acid base status, and then reperfusion where there's more change, you could have a basic excess of minus 12 and you're starting to get into trouble. Yeah. I mean, you know, remembering all the other things such as potassium shifts and stuff like that. And that makes sense now because if you simply looked at acid base the way we usually do this, you would look at bicarbonate and, and everything and else. And you think, still. what the hell's yeah. going on here? Going on? Yeah. Uh, hey, what did you do then about that? Oh, look, this is so long ago. I honestly <laughs> can't remember. I think, I think at that point we ignored it. At this point, now I would say let's let's just give some um, uh, chloride free sodium, okay, or sodium and carbon dioxide. Yep. And the reason I emphasize the, the carbon dioxide bit is that there's a so-called paradoxical effect of giving sodium bicarbonate, which is um, that you get an acidosis, and you do because you're effectively it's as if your 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 surgeons have got laparoscopic. Remembering bicarbonate, if you think about the the physical chemistry equation and the balance most of the most of the carbon dioxide in plasma is in the bicarbonate form mm -hmm. and so what have you giving bicarbonate and this is where the physical chemistry comes in and you're shifting you're actually effectively increasing the vco2 yeah. and so you need to you know if you do have an acid base problem then you need to increase your alveolar minute ventilation to allow for the effective increase in vco2 the carbon dioxide production and that's not too much of a problem it would seem you know you you give sodium bicarb yeah, but, but you, you've got to think about what, yeah. So if you think I'm now giving sodium, sodium and carbon dioxide, therefore, um, I, you know, and I'm giving it a certain concentration, which is quite close to my, so I expect everything else to drop. 
So other things, you know, the other side effects are you do get loss of calcium and you, know, you will get, you know, if you're already hypokalemic you, you know, and you alkalize, you're going to get further hypokalemia and things like that. So, you know, there are add-on effects, but if your primary thing is you think, I've got a severe acidemia I want to treat, you know, you're looking at what, you, what you're going to manipulate. So similarly with the patient who I talked about with the base excess of um, minus eight, what, what you could, sorry, plus eight is you could give her normal saline, which actually drop her sodium a bit mm. and bring up the chloride. You know, yeah. if you were, the, the problem with a patient with quite severe metabolic alkalosis is whether they'll breathe adequately after extubation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that's one of the known unknowns when you're dealing with that degree of metabolic alkalosis. Mm. Um, hey, hey, Dave, with the other ions that you that you mentioned, so they're just unmeasured cations and anions. So they're well, like they're, they're predominantly groups. anions. So if it were cations, which you occasionally see things like al, um, some proteins, al, al of aluminium, it's relatively rare to have you know true significant positive you know excess cations. It's usually unmeasured anions. Anions, yeah. And what what examples would those be? Oh, you know, various you know things of the oxidative cycle. Um, right. I mean, you know, the, the one we're now compensating for or know about or measure is lactate. So if you like, that's the mother of all, ab, you know, metabolically abnormal um, yes. uh, products. Yes. But I, I think it's a whole lot of things. I think it's proteins, um, pro probably particularly proteins, sulfate. Um, and, and you're using that, you're using that as a marker of morbidity and mortality, these, these unknown. I, well, well to, to use a, you know, no, no, a, a, some would say a degree of mayhem. Yeah. Yeah, and, and mayhem equaling worse outcomes. So, but also it's hard to treat. I mean, it really, I mean, yes, you can attenuate it, but it means there's, there's a bad process going on. The same way when you've got hyperlactemia, the beauty of, of, the, of the bedside steward approach is you can actually quantify the effect of lactate. And so when you often, when you've got patients, uh, and the example I use in, in the, is a patient who's got cirrhosis, they've come in with a bleed or something, they've had saline resuscitation ED. So they've now got their underlying, you know, um, pre-existing um, sodium chloride acidosis that's been aggravated by the saline. And they've now got sort of sepsis on top of that. Yeah. And so you're trying to work out what's going on, you know, which, but also it helps you, if it's predominantly sodium chloride, it's not as bad as if yep. it's predominantly um, unmeasured ions. And, 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 I mean, and those are the, so, you know, reading the article and just to so, sort of summarize it and, and um, you're looking at four things. You're looking at the strong iron difference. You're looking well, at the sodium chloride difference as, as the primary strong iron difference in plasma. Yes. The, so, the sodium and chloride. You're looking at lactate, which yep. you mentioned. Yep. You're looking at albumin. Yep. And then you're comparing that to the base excess. So, so you're looking at the, you've got the overall base excess as your, overall metabolic metric which, which you get on your blood gas which you get on your blood gas yep. the thing to remember is to use the standard base excess not the a so the spe not the actual base excess and, and just for everyone what's the difference between the two so it's a historical thing so sigurd anderson who invented base excess the way he did it was he put blood in the box and he equilibrated with a CO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. So if you like, he removed the respiratory side and he looked at how much you had to titrate. So how much, so if, if blood had a pH of, you know, 7.5, how much hydrochloric acid did you have to put in, in millimole per liter of blood to return to the magic point of pH 7.40? So remember your CO2 is 40. So your pH is 7.40, so you're returning to the magic point. So the problem was that he used blood alone. And remembering blood in the physiological system is in, connected with the interstitial fluid, which has less buffering capacity. Whereas the red cells, remembering with the hamburger shift and all that sort of stuff, if you're looking just at the plasma as a solution in its own right, the red cells are part of what modifies it. I mean, one of the things I think is to say, this is a snapshot, don't, don't try and confuse yourself too much about why it is what it is. You know, all the various things across membranes. Once you start thinking about things across membranes, it just becomes you know, a bit hard to deal with. Mm. So um, anyway, so what he, what people criticized him for was that it didn't really reflect the physiological buffering, you know, the, um, of what happens in the body compared to what happens just in blood. Right. So he modified the equations. Um, so, so you, 
modified a bit, sort of did some more assays and effectively assumed less buffering by blood. That's what okay. I'm going to do. Red, red cells, sorry, is what I should say. Um, and that was called the standard base success, or some people call it the extracellular fluid base success or the plasma base success. And why they continue to produce the actual base success or the ABE, I don't know, yep. because it's not all that helpful. And it only, they are, the two only really separate out probably more extremes, but the more reliable number is the standard base success. Okay. And, and just in passing, the way that is calculated is that it's what's called the Van Slyck equation. So remembering blood gas machines measure pH, measure carbon dioxide and calculate everything else. And so, and so yeah, and so, and so you, and so we're going through the, um, the base excess and what else? We okay. So I've got the base excess. Yep. And you're then remembering, we're thinking about how much we change from the magic point. So the usual, as you said before, Stan, the difference between sodium and chloride, so 140, which is the midpoint, and 105, but depending on the assay, chloride assays vary a little bit. Um, so 35. And if it is, if that difference is less than 35, then that, that is acidifying. So you'll get a negative effect on the base excess. And then you've got lactate. Um, so the higher the lactate effect, that, that's a strong anion. So we've already allowed for the cations and the sodium chloride effect. So we don't need to rethink about sodium again. Yep. So we're just looking at lactate and we assume a normal lactate value or the magic point is one millimole per liter and how much it has increased from there. Yep. Sometimes a little bit down, not much. And then albumin, how much it's changed, which is usually a decrease from 42. 40, okay. The answer to life, the universe and everything. And, um, and and in this formula, we don't we don't need to think about phosphates or, or where do phosphates? Well, well, you you can put in phosphate. In or most patients, it's unimportant. Yeah. But if you had a patient who had raised unmeasured irons and they had a raised phosphate, you can't. There is a calculation for phosphate yeah, as okay. well, which is about it's only about a third of the the concentration. So if you, it might change things a bit. But in terms of big time change, the, the really big changes are probably going to be sodium chloride and lactate, and then after that, so is then the, the unmeasured ions. Yeah. And, and when you, you know, you, you've got this formula here, other ions equals mm. base excess minus those things we mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the end, having that value, what do you do with that value? So it's an indicator of badness, for want of a better phrase. Mm. So if you see that, so patient comes to you, you put them on the table, you know, they've got an acute, you know, say if they've got a, an acute abdomen, um, and you've done a gas and you see they've got a base excess of minus seven. Um, you know, again, they've had some saline um, uh, resuscitation in ED and, and you're working it out. Now, if you have a other unmeasured iron effect or other iron effect more negative than minus five, there is some evidence, it's not definitive, that it is a poor prognostic factor, that there is really bad things going on. What you would hope to see is when our surgical friends fix the gut, that it improves. Yeah. Um, so you're just saying, you know, in, in terms of your gestalt of how bad is this, and you know, do I, you know, do they go to HDU, do they go to ICU or whatever? Do I leave them ventilated? Um, now it's those sort of it just helps add to the overall opinion. You know, it, 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 if we go back to our pilot analogy that we like to use when we think about ourselves, it's yet another variable helping you to think about what is my overall plan here? What am I going to do? What's, what are the important things? My suspicion is that basic is more negative than minus five for other ions is, is actually going to be quite strongly associated with in-hospital mortality. Mm. Uh, so it also then means it affects your discussions with family, you know, the surgeons, everyone else. You, know, you do your time out and find you've got other iron effect of minus eight. So guys, this patient's pretty sick. Yep. I mean, what, I mean, I often talk about plasma chemistry as being a bit like astronomy. What we'd really like to know is what's happening at those exoplanets around stars, but we're looking through our telescopes, and radio telescopes and things. Mm -hmm. And plasma chemistry is a bit the same. Mm -hmm. We really want to know what's happening in the cells. And we see the plasma chemistry re reflecting that. Um, and if you've got a lot of other iron effect, then there's a lot of badness happening in the cells. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, the gestalt of how sick is my patient, it adds to that overall information, you know, your hemodynamics and how much noradrenaline they require and everything else, mm -hmm. the amount of pus the surgeons are seeing. But it, it just helps you have a better feel for that individual patient. You know, I'm going to say, I really appreciate that now, you know, reading this article, it's so, it's so new to what I was used to doing. Yeah. 
uh, that I didn't get a sense of the overall thing. But, you know, looking at this equation, you know, I can look at the base X, I can look at the sodium chloride mm -hmm. difference and the lactate and the albumin. I know which components of those are making a problem. And I know when the final other ions number is very negative, that is a big problem. And, you know, I, th I think that, that, that sounds really useful. Now, now, something I must mention. So a colleague um, from India um, has come up with the acronym SALT. She, she emailed me and um, uh, mentioned that th this acronym she's come up with, which is great. So it's, it's for the this bedside suit approach. So it's sodium chloride, albumin, lactate, and trash ions, or the unmeasured ions. And I think the word trash is great because it actually emphasizes this is bad. And the good thing is that also, if you go up that, that's probably the importance of the pathology underlying the acid base changes. So you've got the, the, the degree of the change, which is your pH and your basics and everything. And then you've got what that signal means across the different components. So as I said, sodium chloride is a, yes, it can have a major acid base effect, but as a, as a severity of the mechanism, if you like, is not nearly as bad as lactate or trash ions. Mm. And so it's just also a way of remembering the various bits of salt, S-A-L-T. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's really good. We, we're, we're a big fan of mnemonics. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, I mean, I, I think one of the things we haven't really discussed too much is, is the traditional approach. We've mentioned basic success, and I, I think it is quite reasonable to say my approach to the metabolic side is basic success. Um, so yeah, that leads on to my question, actually. Um, yeah. I've always used base success as a pure metabolic problem, uh, indicator of a pure metabolic yeah. problem. But if there is a chronic respiratory process, ah, yes. does that change? It? Just from reading this now, I'm thinking, do I need to change what I was thinking for so many years? Well, that, that's a very interesting question because it's something I'm keen to actually look into. So there was a paper by a guy called Schlichtig. Um, and others, and one of the others was the famous John Severinghouse, he of the Electrode, that they published in the late 1990s. And for a whole lot of reasons, including the fact the Americans don't like base success and other things, that they have the corrections for base success, and they're wonderfully simple. Mm. So if you have, and I've actually simplified it further, but I, I'm yet to demonstrate my simplification is not an oversimplification, but if you have acute respiratory change, you expect no change in your base success. So, you know, the, the, fir the first two limbs of the hectopus are easy. Then if you have a metabolic change, so a change in your base excess is your primary change. For acidosis, you expect a one-to-one -one change in millimetres of mercury for your CO2. So if your base excess is minus five, you expect your, um, your CO2 to be down 30. You know, by about one-to-one no, uh, -one stand. Yeah, so, so sorry, so minus five, well, let's make it minus 10, then down yeah. down by 10. Okay. So we're saying, we're saying normal is 40 or 35 for the CO2? 40. So stick okay, with the, sorry. Stick so with the I think 35, sorry. This 40. is the whole okay. point, stick with the magic yeah. point, Stan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. This no, is no, the whole no, no, point. It's true. Like, otherwise, you screw your head. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. 100%. So yeah. we're saying normal CO2 is 40. Okay. Yeah. I, I, was, I was thinking 35, but yeah, okay, 40. So, so, so for every change in... Um, so, so, so it's a one for one. So remember, yeah. but I mean, remember the beauty of base success is the the direction change is the same as the direction with bicarbonate. So if you remember the, the argument, why do you remember? You remember you have some, have some hassle back because the ratio needs to stay the same to keep yep. the pH the same. Okay, so that's that's the changes are always the compensatory change is meant to be in the same direction, yep. with the rule of thumb that you rarely return to to seven point four. You with compensation you rarely return to the the magic number. Okay, but that's a rough rule of thumb. Yeah. So if your base excess um, and then for metabolic alkalosis, it's 0.5. So if your base excess goes up to you know, plus 10, you'd expect your CO2 to be up by about five. Right. Okay. Now, the question then becomes, what, what are the confidence intervals for that? Now, it isn't, and this is where, so my view is that for base excess, so if you're looking at the base excess, Okay, so right, respiratory, we've said zero. Yeah. And my view of the, the reference range for base excess is probably plus or minus 2.5, mm -hmm. which then fits in with the idea that if you change more than 2.5, there's probably something going on. If you're going five, which is twice that, there is something going on. Okay. Metabolically. Yeah. So if you go to the, the chronic change, so chronic changes are again about half. So if your CO2 um, is 
is decreased, you'd expect your base excess to be more negative. That is, um, you know, this is one of the difficult base excess because you talk about more negative. So if your CO2 um, goes down to 30 chronically, yep. you expect your base excess to be about minus five. Okay. But, or how, um, but how about acidosis? Because acidosis is probably a lot more common, chronic respiratory acidosis. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Well, so, um, so if your CO2 goes to, to 50, yep. again, it's about 0.5. So you'd expect your base excess to be about plus five. For, for a chronic respiratory acidosis. Yeah, acidosis. So just, acidosis. And so just thinking how I'm going to use this new bit of information. So I, I have a base access in a chronic a patient who's chronically unwell with COPD. I'm not going to assume that the base access is a, is a pure metabolic issue occurring here. Uh, and so that, that, you know, let's say yeah. you're a CO2 retainer, PCO2 is 50. I'm going to account for, I'm going to count at some level if this patient comes in acutely unwell. That, yeah. Yeah. So, so my, my view roughly is that respiratory change or respiratory compensation, no matter which rules you're using, are probably about plus or minus five. Mm -hmm. So if you apply your rules of thumb, so say if your base excess has, you know, has changed by, you know, is now minus 10, you expect your CO2 to drop by 10, but anywhere between about five and 15 is probably within the, the limits well, of variation. Okay. No, so, you know, if it's radically different from that that sort of range, so I don't think this, I think there's a secondary disorder. But remembering, often I think we've become too OCD about some of this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it is a rough rule of thumb. It's it's not, you know, a, a law of physiology. It, it, it's it's the sort of roughly the expected change, roughly what's going on. You can imagine you see a patient and you you know what's going on before you read the blood gas. Uh, you yeah. Know, you pick it all in the clinical context anyway. I mean, the, the other interesting thing related to that, just, just in passing, is actually the use of bicarbonate. Remembering bicarbonate can also be seen as total CO2. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the things, and this is sort of where we come back to the physical chemistry. So the way CO2, not the blood gas assays, so remember blood gas is pH, CO2, and then the henderson Hasselbach equation. The way the, the labs do it is they actually drive it in such a way that you're looking at, and, you know, if you think back to the original um, Van Slyke thing, what they used to do is acidify the blood. So you've got the bicarbonate hydrogen in, they acidify and push it all into CO2 and then look at the change in volume or pressure. because And that's why it's like called the total CO2. And they throw in a fudge factor of, you know, 0.95. So not, assume 95% is in the bicarbonate form, blah, blah, blah. And that's how they report a bicarbonate. And that's how, if you do a standard set of UNEs. So if you have patients who have chronic hypoventilatory respiratory failure. So remembering the, the new kids on the block are those who have who have obesity central hypoventilation syndrome. So one of the ways to screen for that is to actually look at the bicarbonate on the pre-op um, UNEs. And if it's over about 30, there's a good chance that they've got, unless there's another reason for them to have a metabolic alkalosis, that they in fact have chronic hypercapnia. Yeah. That, that, that's just sort of bringing this all together. That's sort of yes. the concept of total CO2, bicarbonate, the physical chemistry, the compensation. So my view is that the, the compensation rules for bicarbonate using base excess are much easier. Remembering uh, the, the patients with the chronic changes, depending on your practice, are relatively rare. I mean, we don't see a lot of patients now with, with you know, really hypercapnic respiratory failure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and the, sorry, the old smokers, the new group are now sort of the, the people with obesity, hypoventilation syndromes and sleep apnea. And um, the only downside with base access is that you need an arterial blood gas. No, is why? It? You don't. So you can actually get it off a venous, a yeah, venous yeah, 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 yeah. And, and is that something, because, you know, when you look at the biochemistry of these patients, when you do a pre-op assessment, there's bicarb there, but very rarely do they actually give you the base access. Is that something well, you ask specifically... No, so see, base excess, you need the pH. So, so this is what the whole point, the bicarbonate they've given you is by, by a completely different technique. So the bicarbonate, you know, the gold standard bicarbonate is calculated from the henderson hasselbach equation using a, a pH electrode and a CO2 electrode. Hmm. What they're doing for bicarbonate is to create, work out the total CO2, so the total carbon dioxide via an assay, yeah. and they've, they've changed a bit over time, and then throw in a fudge factor of, you know, take 5% off on the basis that, you know, 95% of the total carbon dioxide in plasma is in the bicarbonate form. So, yeah. so that, that's what that you'll sometimes see it called TCO2, but, right. but you can't do base excess because you haven't got the pH. Okay. 
So, so is that is that something you you need to request specifically when you do um, bloods for these patients? What's like, that? The the base access for you know. On no, a, well, the only way I mean you'd need to do a gas, but but so I do, mean, do it on a venous gas. I yeah. mean, my view is you know if you know periodically we get caught out and a patient hasn't had bloods because our surgical friends haven't been organised or whatever, and and you know they've got kidney dysfunction or something, so you, you zip off a venous gas. Venous, okay. Um, yeah. and it's not. You know, as we know, the oxygen side is of little use, yep. except you know, looking for massive oxygen extraction. Yeah. Um, but the the acid base status is relatively similar. Yes, the CO2 is up a little bit, yes. um, depending on the patient. Um, but the the acid the the metabolic acid base status is reasonably similar, similar enough for you to work out whether there's something really bad going on. Yeah, and and that's a very practical tip. Yeah. Isn't it? That we just. Do, do a venous gas and actually well, give you well but, but if you think about the information you get you get your hemoglobin i mean so if you found a significant you know a, 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 a sign of pretty significant metabolic acidosis you're going to ask why so you've got the lactate so you know it's not the lactate you've got the sodium and the chloride so you know it's not that mm. so the you know the probably statistically most likely thing is um chronic kidney disease so you'd be looking at the creatinine and you'd think thanks guys thanks for not measuring the fact that pointing out the EGFR is 25. And, and that, that I mean, my argument is in preoperative testing that hemoglobin, HbA1c, um, albumin, because it was predictive value for poor outcomes in surgery, and uh, EGFR are the four you know, vital tests. Um, but you can work around that a bit. You know, venous gas will give you a lot of information and reassuring information. Don't also, you also know the potassium. So if a patient, you know, if you've got a patient you're a bit concerned about, hemoglobin's okay, they haven't got a metabolic acidosis, the potassium's okay, sodium's okay, glucose is okay, you go, yep. Mm. So I, I'm a very strong advocate of where there's uncertainty, just zip off a venous gas. Yes. And sometimes you have to word up our surgical friends and say, if I'm not happy about this, we're not going to do this. Yes. But, but because it's, it, it's a point of care test that you can do so rapidly, Yes. I think it's so much information. I, I think it's it's a something we grossly on to use. I mean, our, our colleagues in emergency medicine are using it far more hmm. than we have, and I think it's something we could use far more in perioperative medicine. Um, now, I, now, um, I just want to touch on with Lars our summary and the summary you did hmm. with the metabolic acidosis, um, base excess, and CO two change. And I think this is a point of contention for a lot of trainees: hmm. is that so if you have a metabolic acidosis and your base excess um, drops by drops by five. So your, your, your base X is minus five. Yeah. And your CO2 is, um, oh, well, let's say, let's say it drops by 10, make it easy. Yeah. Got, and then your CO2 is 30. Yeah. So you would say that's a metabolic acidosis. That's a compensated. So using compensated. the same terminology. Yeah. Yep. So if you, you think about your options, so you've got, you would assume that you've got a, you know, either a downward or even you know, an acidosis, if not acidemia. Okay. Yep. So you've got an acidemia. It is clear that the, major change is metabolic the yep. question you ask yourself is is this a compensated disorder so if it's uh you know you get minus 10 if it's you know 30 but ranging between 25 and 35 yep then that's compensated yep um and so you roughly know what's going on and and the reason the reason why you wouldn't say that it's a respiratory alkalosis that's compensated so it's compensated respiratory alkalosis what, why is that? Like, what, why, well, well why? because I mean, the whole point is that over the years, over the last, say, 60, 70 years, people have done all this work to say, okay, if you have this change, what do we expect? Mm. This is a physiological thing. What do we expect the body to do in response to this change? And so, what you're saying is that if I have a metabolic acidosis, where my, you know, let's say the bicarbonate's dropped to 14, if you want to go back to old fashioned, yep. or my base excess is dropped by, um, is now minus 10. Yep. Then I expect a person who's not unconscious, you know, with a reasonably functioning brainstem yep. to breathe up and produce a CO2 at about this level. Yes. If they haven't done that, there is something else going on. Yes. From a respiratory point of view, you know, as we know as anaesthetists, they're most likely got altered you know, level of consciousness. Yes. Or, or they have other things. Yes. So that's all you really ask yourself. Is the change in the other system what we expect the body to do or is it something else? Yeah. But, 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 can, but can it happen the other way where you've, got a, where you've got a chronic respiratory alkalosis Yeah. and the base access is actually a compensation 
for that. Yeah, but that, that's what that's what I was trying to say. So the the rules of thumb, yeah, for um for res- chronic remembering chronic, so you need to know the history. Yes, the chronic respiratory change is about 0.5. Okay. So if you CO two, and if you want to see it, you can look at the the blood gases. There was um, Mike Rocott's group published the blood gases from Everest, you know, mm. in the summit of Everest. Yes. And they had a base excess of minus 10, but they also had a CO2 of about, what was it, 15 or something? Really low, yeah. No. So, and that that's an extreme. So this all, remembering all your rules of thumb will fall apart as you head towards extremes. Yes. But, so the answer is yes. And I mean, one of the things I, I'm keen to do is actually go and look at the blood gases of pregnant women. I haven't actually been able to lay my hands on any yet. Because, you know, we don't do a lot of blood gases with pregnant women. But you would suspect that what you would see is a, and this is particularly for base excess, that you would see a low CO2 and a more negative base excess. Yeah. You know what would be really interesting? We do a lot of cord gases. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That would be, those, the blood gases there would be. I mean, uh, the, the beauty of all this stuff is you can look at all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, but the, the, the thing is that you would see the metabolic alkalosis, but what you, the reason you'd expect to see it is that there'd be a change in the sodium chloride strong ion difference. Okay. I, because I, obstetrics is not my practice, I haven't really dug into it and I don't have easy access to um, data from pregnant women, but I suspect if you looked into it, you could actually, from a steward perspective, look at um, the, 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 comp- you know, the, the physiological part of pregnancy from a steward perspective would be something that hasn't been done it'd be quite an interesting study to do um and then and then finally um so if it's compensated you say that it's a compensated like so compensated metabolic acidosis if if there's inadequate compensation do you say there's a metabolic acidosis with inadequate compensation or do you no, say no, no, it mix- is by definition this whole point is by definition a mixed disorder a mixed disorder correct the reason because, it may uh, be a mixed dis- i mean and, and again if you go back to the 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 model of the patient who you just put off you know anesthetized who's now spot venting but effectively hypoventilating if you did a blood gas on them there and then, no matter how healthy the patient, they will have, by definition, a mixed disorder. Mixed disorder. Okay, good. And, and it's really just, a, see, it's a model. It's, it's going back to the whole model idea. Yeah. It's, it's a relatively simple model. How you got there, it's a yes. snapshot. How you got there will differ. Yes. And I think and that just gives such clarity, um, having you having to say that, because mm-hmm. I, there's a lot of confusion in terms of people yeah. saying that compensation or, or inadequate compensation so what yeah, is- yeah stay away from your own, i mean it just confuses yeah, you're, the model. you're either yeah. compensated or there's a mix or there's a mix disorder of yeah or you're in this sort of zone in the in the in the normal range yeah but in reality it's a pretty small zone if you if you look at the there's a very good diagram from guide and you can find it on the youtube of the, of the hectopus so it's got you know ph co2 um Oh, and James Bond, this hectopus. Yeah, oh, well, the, <laughs> no, I agree. But, but I mean, it reminds you that there are six legs. But the, the reason I want people to think about legs is that if you look at the width of them, yeah. Yeah, if you actually look at the width of the, the legs on the hectopus, you realize, and this is where it come back to, you know, the plus or minus 2.5 in base success and plus or minus CO2. I actually measured the width of the, the legs on the hectopus, and that's yeah. roughly about the sort of the difference. Mm. So it isn't like a you know, thin straight line. It's actually quite a wide range which shows this is a rule of thumb. It's not a, you know, bang on. It, there's, a, there's a bit of latitude in this. Yeah. Um, so I, I think Lars, what Lars is going to do now, he's going to run through some blood gases. I, th- I think it's good for us to see yeah. how you would, you would read them. Okay. Um, th- these are examples, I think, that you have presented before. The, yep. But the only, the only thing that I've realized is that we don't have the, um, we don't have the strong iron difference on them. No. And, and, and that, that, might, that might hamper you, Dave, but, I, but I'm sure you're up for the challenge. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, look, uh, so yeah, these are from that presentation. Um, the example yeah. one is just, P- it doesn't have the clinical scenarios, but pH. Can we share the screen now? Yeah. Like here, so that other people can also see the numbers too. Here we go. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll just go through the um, numbers itself. pH 7.43, CO2 37, bicarb 23.5, and uh, standard base excess negative uh, 0.7. Yeah, so although we talk about the, the magic point, if we look at the pH... You know, reference range is 7.35 to 7.45. And this is within the reference range. So, it's it, but it's up a little bit. So in the back of your mind could be that it is a compensated. CO2 is 37. So in the reference range, bicarbonate is 23.5, which is, you know, okay. Basic says is well within the reference range of plus or minus 2.5. So this is a, a 
blood gas that's sitting, you know, in that normal zone. Yep, sounds good. Example two, pH 7.7, yeah. CO2 40, bicarb 28.7, and SBE 4.7. Yeah, so we've got a, a pH that's above the reference range. So that is an alkalemia. So we're looking for an alkalosis. So CO2 is bang on 40. So that's not the cause. Bicarbonate's up as we go past. That's nice. So that's indicating where we're going to go. But quantitatively, we have quite a marked change. And this is, again, this issue with the bicarbonate. Bicarbonate tends to be qualitative. Is it up or not? Basic says quantitatively is up by almost five. So, you know, this would be me saying mm, there's almost certainly something going on here. Um, so the question then becomes, do we expect, so we've got a, a metabolic um, alkalosis. So if we go back to the point we're making before, you know, the, the rough rule of thumb extrapolated from Schlichting's work is we'd expect the CO2 to be up by about 2.5. CO2 is 40, but, you know, we would allow plus or minus five. So you could argue, depending on how OCD you want to be, technically this might be a mixed disorder because we expect the CO2 to be a bit higher, but it's probably within the, the acceptable range. So I would, you know, it is reasonable to say this may well be a compensated, um, perhaps undercompensated um, metabolic alkalosis. And, and Dave, like, this is like, your, your, your understanding of this is just next level. So, mm. and you can tell that because you've got, you've got different, um, you know, you can interpret the gas, but you can, you've got a, a variety of answers. It, it, it's either compensated or you can say it's mixed. Like for the, for like a, a primary candidate reading this gas, what would the examiner expect? Would they well, expect I, I, they I mean, the, the reality is that most things in the exam will be more, if we go through some of the more extreme ones, this is a little, to my mind, be a little bit subtle. Okay. Yeah, you, know, you mean the CO2 is bang on 40, so that might be an argument that it's a bit underdone, but you'd only expect it to be up by about two and a half. You know, so we're, we're you know, my view would be, and I, I think we under teach, you know, if you look at the acid base text, they really under teach the whole point. There's actually a fair bit of latitude in the rules of thumb. Right. I mean, you know, the Americans you know, have these really precise equations. So, yeah, but what's the latitude in your equation? And, and, and those and those equations you're mentioning are the, are the Boston, the Boston yeah. So rules. the sort of Boston rules of thumb. I mean, we've just talked about sort of if you like the modified Schlichting rules, which are much simpler. So you know, there's a whole lot of Boston rules of thumb, which is what. So it's what would you expect roughly? So you know, and I think I don't think an examiner would give one that's sort of where the CO two is that subtle. It's likely to be you know much more obvious one way or the other. Okay, and we'll, we'll see that when we go on a bit. That's right. Example three, pH 7.37, CO2 50, bicarb 28.3, and SBE yeah. 3.4. Yeah. So we've got um, pH, which is below 7.4. So you know, there's a little bit of alkalosis going on, but we do not have an alkalemia. A a CO acidemia. Oh, sorry, acidemia. No, that's what happens here. It's easy. CO2 is up. So can we ex do we ex so we do have a respiratory acidosis. CO2 is up by about 10. Um, bicarb, but so for compensation, expect your bicarb to be up. It is up. Um, and, you know, for base excess, uh, if you look at the rules of thumb, then you say CO2 is up by 50. You'd, if it were, were acute, you'd expect no change in base excess. And this is sort of okay. within the, the, the reference range. If this were chronic, um, which it could well be, then you would expect your base excess to be up by about half the change in CO2. Um, so about five, but plus or minus 2.5. So this is either, if it's acute, it is a um, mixed disorder of a, a respiratory acidosis with a metabolic alkalosis. And if it's chronic, then it's, it's a compensated um, respiratory acidosis. If this was, um, you know, following Boston rules, uh, 10, 10 up on the CO2 equals four up on the bicarb. So this yeah. pretty much fits that as a chronic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the other thing to think about, the way I, I des describe the, the compensation is, is like acclimatization. It is an amplified physiological response. Again, emphasizing this is physiological. So, you know, if you like, you sit, you, your kidneys have got used to sort of, having to keep, you know, this will be a difference in sodium and chloride if you go 
looking at that side. So the kidneys have got used to really amplifying the, the situation. What the mechanism is, no one knows. And, and so in this in this case here, sorry, um, like just go back to the previous slide, the, the strong iron difference, what would you expect the strong iron difference to be? I would expect the strong iron difference to be the sodium chloride difference, probably a slight lower chloride. So chloride probably like about 100 or 101, something like that. That yeah, would be so my guess, assuming this patient doesn't have a low albumin, which is another possibility. Yes. Remembering you know, the association between low albumin and chronic disease. And, and so just to summarize, so that, that bicarb is actually um, the result of what's happening that's not on the screen. It's ha what, what's happening with the strong iron difference, what's happening with the albumin concentration and what's yeah. happening with, with lactate. Yeah. Yeah, that's all factoring in, and that's all producing this this number. Well, the fact that it's alkalosis, it's only like really likely to be the sodium chloride difference, particularly the chloride. Mm. Um, rarely, it's the sodium um, yeah. and the albumin. And the albumin, right? But, but given that the the size of the change, remember the albumin would it was albumin alone, then the albumin would have had to decrease by about fifteen gram per liter. I mean, this, about, is, this is just, I mean, like even though I, I've read this so many times. Like, I think that's just such clarity that, that yeah. now, you know, that now that when I read it, when I, when I see a bicarb, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at um, the strong iron difference between sodium and chloride and then look at the albumin. And, and if there's a lactate, they look at the lactate. And, and, and those are the yeah. three things, yeah. That yeah. Are, the, 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 the albumin bicarb. is the collision between the two because the, the hardcore bicarbonate people refuse to accept that there is an alkalosis due to albumin. They just call oh, it right. and so but 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 they push really hard for correcting the anion gap for albumin. But there the just is there's almost like a cognitive disconnect. Yep. Um and that that is, I think, the if I really want to push someone in the bicarbonate world, I'd say, well, explain to me this very clear association between um low albumin and raised um bicarbonate. Let's go to this next one. Mm -hmm. So pH seven point two. Yeah. CO2 60, bicarb 22.8, and standard base access negative 6.4. Yeah, so this is, you know, um, pH is, is acidemic. It's also less than 7.25. So I'd call this a, a pretty significant, uh, uh, reasonably severe acidemia. Um, CO2 is up by 20 from the magic point. So there is a significant respiratory component. So my question now is, that I would, if there were compensation, both the bicarbonate and base excess would be raised, so above 24 and be more positive than zero. In fact, they're both negative. So I already know this is a mixed disorder. Mm -hmm. I would comment that in fact, the base excess is more negative than minus five. So this is actually a pretty solid metabolic uh, acidosis. So we have a mixed respiratory and metabolic acidosis, the metabolic both being reasonably severe, producing quite severe acidemia. And, and can you make a comment on the bicarb? Because with a base excess of minus 6.4, you'd expect the bicarbs in the teens. Yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> so this is where it gets complex. This is the, the comes to the heart of why you know you really want basic um base excess. So remembering that um the way base excess came about was from the you know the Copenhagen um epidemic of polio, um, which is you know somewhat ironic because we're now in a pandemic. Um, but that you know the the patients had really high bicarbonates and that was because of the association between carbon dioxide. So the total CO2 will be up. So part of one of the things contributing to that bicarbonate is in fact, the total CO2. Yeah. You know, the, the lungs are not adequately physiologically. And this is the intersection between the, the, the physical chemistry and the physiology. So the physiologically, the kidneys are not adequately dealing with the, the by with the CO2. Uh, sorry, the, the, the lungs can't deal with the CO2. The kidneys, you've got a raise in bicarbonate. This is where base excess is really revealing. You know, if you look to the bicarbonate alone, you say, well, it's only really down by 1.2, big deal, who cares? But in fact, the base excess is showing that it's actually quite a severe metabolic acidosis. And I, I think this is really sort of the advantage of base excess, you know, that this you know, physiology and physical chemistry of CO2 and, and bicarbonate, you're really separating them out by using base excess. Excellent. I might go for this as the last one. Um, example five. And this is actually a patient I was involved with. I didn't actually cause. So this patient has a life-threatening um, 
acidemia. Yeah. So remembering that for I'll, every I'll, point three, I'll just go through the um, numbers just for the yeah, uh, sorry, yeah. Ones. Yeah. pH six point eight eight, CO two eighty two, bicarb eleven point three, and SBE negative twenty point nine. Yeah. So this is a patient with life-threatening acidemia, remembering the rule of thumb is that for every 0.3 change in, um, in pH, you get a doubling or halving of the hydrogen ions. Mm -hmm. So by the time you know, it goes um, 7.4, 7.1, you've gone from 40 to 80. Mm -hmm. Here we've got another 0.3 effectively, so we've now gone to 160. So we've got a fourfold increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. So this is why it's now life-threatening. The, the hydrogen ion concentration, independent of the severity of whatever's causing this, is, is life-threatening in its own right mm. because it has affected the functioning of so many proteins, both extracellularly and intracellularly. And I've, I mean, one of my part of my thinking is, in fact, one of the things I probably underestimate is how much a change in extracellular fluid pH may affect even like the transport proteins on membranes. Mm -hmm. You know, we think about intracellular, extracellular, but what about the membrane itself and the function of that? You know, that, that's just a passing comment. Mm -hmm. So we have a life-threatening acidemia. We have CO2 is now 82, so marked raise. If this were compensated, which, you know, you know in the back of your mind it's not going to be, mm -hmm. you'd expect the bicarb to be massively raised, in fact, massively decreased. Base excess is minus um, 20. So you've got severe metabolic uh, respiratory acidosis, severe metabolic acidosis, so a, a life-threatening mixed uh, acidosis disorder. Mm. And and so, Dave, if you were to give sodium bicarb, or, or what you like to call sodium and carbon dioxide, this would be counterproductive in this patient. Is that well? But, but you know that I mean, part of the management of this patient acutely, either way, is to you know they're going to be unconscious. You know, the CO2 of 82. So part of their management is urgent intubation, mechanical ventilation and, mm -hmm. and ventilate them hard yep. um, to change things. So that would that would probably bring you, well, you know, back into sort of 7.1 or whatever. Um, and then my suspicion would be that this patient has a dramatically raised uh, lactate. So what you would do acutely is to, to give, and I have done this for a patient with severe lactic acidosis, just to buy yourself time that you would give them um, sodium chloride. So if you gave them pure sodium chloride, you'd be pushing the sodium up. Um, the change in osmolality will also lead to fluid shifts into the plasma and that sort of thing and out of the cells. So that will sort of, you know, it will dilute everything a bit. So the lactate, assuming you can fix the, the production of lactate will, will be diluted as well. So that's one of the things that, in this situation where you've got other ions and you give a reasonable volume. So one of the reasons about giving the, the mixture, you know, with sort of 1.2 litres of, um, of chloride of, of sodium and carbon dioxide or, or sodium bicarbonate um, is that you also dilute things as well. So yeah. you'll get, not only will you change the chloride concentration, but you'll also dilute the lactate, dilute the other ions and buy yourself time. You know, this is not treating, you know, we've got acidemia that's so severe that it's producing hypotension and things like that, yeah. then you will be treating that in the short term. But, yes. but the bottom line with acid base is you need to treat the underlying problem. And the problem, yeah. So, so ventilate the patient hard, um, try to find the cause of the metabolic acidosis, most probably mm. lactate, most probably due to perfusion. Yeah. So you want to I mean, that. this could also be someone who's brought in with life-threatening sepsis too, you know, unconscious, Yes. you know, um, and you know, in terms of fluid therapy, so that the trainees know, don't use sodium chloride? Well, look, if you've got a patient who's, you know, this is also coming back to what we're talking about, the, the, the big picture. If you've got a patient who is bleeding out, who has life-threatening hypovolemia for whatever reason, then it may be more important in the short term to deal with that. You might even blow them even harder. I mean, remembering also their acidemia is already very severe. Um, you might make it a little bit worse, but you won't make it a lot worse. Okay. And, I, and, and, my, and my view would be, I'd rather, someone who's profoundly hypovolemic, I'd rather give them saline than no yep. fluid. Yes. I you mean, you know, I'd rather reach my plasmolite if I had it Yes. Um, in this setting. But also, you know, the reality is they're also going to need blood and everything else, depending on what the cause is. If this is, in fact, you know, hypovolemic shock and active bleeding, which, might, which was what this patient was. And, and if you had Hartman's and Plasmolite, you would choose Plasmolite. But what are the issues of using Hartman's for this resuscitation? 
Well, plasmalite has a wider, you know, sodium chloride strong ion difference. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, what is it, 42? Yeah. Um, whereas Hartman's is, you know, only about, what was it, um, 139, it's about 30. Yes. Roughly. Yes. So, you, you've got, the, the other advantage is that you, one of the reasons I use plasmalite is in situations where lactate is also a marker of how you're going. So say liver resections and liver transplants. So that you're not adding the atrogenic lactate. The other advantage of the acetate in, um, in Hartman, in plasmalite is that it, it's more widely metabolized than, than just the Cori cycle and, lact and lactate yeah. in the liver. So to actually have the advantage. So the thing is when you drop the solutions in because of electron neutrality, you actually are dropping in other strong ions. Yeah. So when we've done, we've actually done studies looking at acid base when you, with, with bypass prime. And that leads to, you know, instant acidemia, which then resolves as these, the other ions are removed from the plasma. So this is the other beauty of, of, of Stuart, that in terms of the lactic, lactate in, in Hartman's, why do you get an alkalosis? It's because you just take it out of the plasma and that's it. You don't have to worry about the metabolism. You know, by, by altering the strong iron difference, by altering the concentration of lactate in, in the fluid, um, that's why you get more bicarbonate. I th hey, thanks so much, Dave. Um, I've just noticed it's probably coming up to about 90 minutes. So time, uh, time passes when you're having fun. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, this was, know, I, I mean, this was so interesting. I, like even even like all these years, I've never had that depth of understanding that I that I do now. You know, with this well, well, look, I mean, I know I keep coming back to the app, but it is a chance just to give it a go. And, and what I say to people is, look, I'm not saying you must do this. What I'm saying is give it a go, you know, 10 patients, 10 gases, whatever, and just see how it affects your thinking. Hmm. If you find it valuable, fine. If you don't, that's also fine. I don't, I don't mind. And because there'll be a whole lot of people who over, you know, say have 20 years of practice, got so used to bicarbonate, that that's just how they think and that, you know, but we get we get indoctrinated through it in med school. That's the um, that's the that's the problem. Not to say the problem, but that's the. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, when I teach the med students, I teach the traditional bicarbonate because, you know, the nephrologist, and anyone else I'll meet, that that's how they think. Yeah. But I think as as critical care physicians, this is a much more pragmatic, unified, uh, quantitative way to approach very complex patients. Is that the app there? That's it. Yep. Okay. That was actually the first hit on Google when I. Oh, look, we're, we're and winning. Up. And if, if you look at the help um, button, it then go. it references my paper, but then as you scroll down, also has the equations and things. Oh, that's really useful. Um, yeah. So, again, it, the whole point is the change, you know, the, the magic point includes the magic point of each of those electrolytes sodium chloride, albumin, lactate. And then change beyond change than those is, is, are the other ions mm -hmm. so we're looking nice. we're looking you know i mean we could include absolutely everything you ever find in plasma routinely but it just makes it doesn't improve the model in my view and you know but the uh, there are people who say oh you can't possibly have it this simple and that was the whole point george box was making 40 years ago you want a good pragmatic simple model that you can apply in our settings and, and that's that's how i view this so well, thank you so much, Dave, for coming to speak with us and giving your time. Um, and such, such an enlightening talk. I, I almost feel a bit ashamed that oh, it's been so long since I've actually learned this. No, uh, look, I mean, you know, <laughs> look, there's been m many a, a fellow who's sat through a liver transplant with me and I've beaten it into them. So, But, <laughs> but I just say to them, give it a go. Let's look at what we've got here. Let's, let's look at the different approaches and, and how we're thinking about this. Um, and I, I think that's the value, you know, how are we thinking about our individual, you know, we have a whole lot of inputs into our decision making. And this is, this is just another way to, to deal and quantify. I think I'm really kind of the word quantify, you know, we're trying to, and then the, the, the importance of, of the various influences, you know, quantifying, but also the degree of severity of disease that they make. Thanks everyone for listening to Anesthesia Coffee Break. Thanks very, very much, Professor Dave Story for coming along and entertaining our acid-based physiology. And uh, as always, yeah, please uh, share with anyone who might be interested and see you again next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>